principles to take a view that they do not still want to see bonuses as part of the landscape of the covered banks until such time particularly as they're back in profitability. Okay, but, but in effect, and, and profitability and bonuses are not necessarily related, as you well know, RBS last week, Lloyds last week, lots of other banks last week had huge losses and they handed out massive bonuses uh, to people and so they don't seem to be related European-wide at all, in fact. Banks making losses still pay bonuses for spoiling. What I'm trying to say is this, is this new rule, which is a two-to-one rule or even bigger, does that actually open the floodgates for bonuses in Ireland again? The rule is simply just a cap on the maximum that we paid. But the bonuses. I, 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 that's what you back to, okay? the, the structure of compensation. But it does not open the floodgates in respect of bonuses, in respect of the covered banks, until such time as the government decide to open the floodgates, as you put it, and permit bonuses to be paid, because there are currently restrictions which operate in parallel to these rules which apply across the rest of Europe and in effect are designed to act as a limitation on the structure of payroll where bonuses are in fact paid and have therefore no application at the moment where it's not permitted. But they're likely to come in, aren't they, to come in here? If they're European-wide and they were brokered here there are, the Irish government? There are bonuses paid at the moment and there have been bonuses paid last year and the year before across Europe. That doesn't make it any more likely that we will be paying bonuses in 2013 in Ireland at the moment. The fact that they changed the rules to control those bonus provisions or those bonus structures does not, I don't think, make it more likely that we would suddenly see bonuses either here in Ireland. Okay. Right. Time to... Okay, I'll just, okay, I'll, just, I'll, just get, uh, I'll just finish for a second. The, yeah, the public interest directors, which I think Deputy Harris and the auditors, which we touched on. Do you have any input into the auditors, how they're chosen? The Deputy would be delighted to know that since the last time we had this discussion, it was KPMG. All of the, all of the boards were asked to review the situation yeah. of their auditors, and in fact, as they were already planning to do, but it was commercially sensitive at the time, I couldn't reveal that some of them have in fact changed their auditors. Yes, I noticed that. and uh, I. I'm sure that you'll claim the credit for it. I didn't claim credit. I was perfectly happy to leave the credit. Uh, uh, and it, it's an interesting point that uh, very soon after that, KPMG was AIB put it out to tender, and, and, uh, and I congratulate you on that. I think it was a great development. Um, but KPMG, for instance, suddenly turned up as the special liquidator in IBRC. How did that happen? Yeah, we actually had a conversation about this earlier. Sorry, I wasn't here. <laughs> Sorry, I had to vote. I had to vote. But essentially, the selection of KPMG, as, as, or the selection of a special liquidator, uh, as would be obvious, was not something that could be done by public tender um, because of the sensitivity of the situation. So what we did in order to try and protect the situation as far as possible was to approach the NAMA management, who already had, in effect, panels of liquidators that they had gone through a process in terms of sort of setting rates and sort of setting their suitability to act as liquidators. We then dismissed from that panel those people who were in what we considered to be on inappropriate conflict situations. Therefore, those that would have had significant litigation, as an example, which related to auditing and that, were dismissed, and then the selection was made by sort of the minister as to whom he would choose, and ultimately by the government. I, I, I half understand what you're saying. I, I don't fully understand it because the, the, the record of KPMG, for instance, having been auditors to Irish Nationwide during that 2006-2011 period, having been auditors to AIB during the same period when the books, to say the least, were questionable. Does that not make you say, hey, we might go and use another firm, these guys are flawed? KPMG has been fined huge sums of money, by the way, by, uh, by, by IASA as well. Does that, is that not a consideration when you're making the, the choice? Everything is a consideration in terms of the choice, and we gave advice as to the choices of who could be picked to the minister and the government. But I think we could probably also say that there are other firms in town 
So I could probably do the same thing with respect to have a situation if I wanted to look into particular parts of the operation of those firms where I could see something that one of the firms was actually in litigation with the bank as to, in fact, there are the current auditors of the bank who I don't think would necessarily, you know, have stepped into being appropriate. I don't know if you want to add anything in terms yeah, of you. No, I mean, other than to say uh, there are also a relatively few <coughs> number uh, of uh, liquidators who would have sufficient size and spread internationally to be able to handle the IBRC liquidation. So we were choosing from among a small number of firms, a very small, a relatively small number of firms, uh, all of whom have in some way or other some connections, Ireland being what it is, with some of the existing banks. Uh, so it was a question of a choice that was made. But I know, I, I accept that. I know you've got a problem with this, but this is a, this is a company with a deplorable record, particularly with the banks. It's a, it's a company which let the AIB accounts through. It's a company which let the Irish Nationwide through with full approval and all those extraordinary valuations which they had. And then they come up to be liquidators of IBRC. Do, do you not see the problem that an outsider has, seeing the same, the same name, big name, popping up with a flawed record? That's the choice that the government made. Well, I presume under, yeah. your, under, with, under your advice. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Chairman, you want me to finish? I'm asking to finish up. Okay. Um, no, that's fine. That's fine. I'll find for that. I might come back a bit later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want to take up a couple of points. The bonuses to bankers. For, can we take it that until the Irish taxpayer and the Irish state supports covered institutions, during that period, there would be no bonuses paid within banks. Uh, I can't give you a guarantee on that because that's ultimately a decision that the government will have to take. I think what we have said is that it's very important while, well, I think it's very important in any event for any shareholder, but it's particularly important while the state is a shareholder in the banks, that the bank's management find ways to return the banks to profitability and be very careful about the levels of remuneration that they pay. Including bonuses? Including bonuses, but I would point out that in some respects there are scenarios in which the idea of paying people based on the delivery is also an important way of structuring compensation. And so I don't want to tie the hands, the government may decide that they want to do that, of how in fact compensation structure is, is set up. Well, can I just, the backdrop, and it's taking up on the mortgage issue again, right? And, you know, context is everything. And, and the context is, is that, <clears throat> and I suppose I'm linking into the whole mortgage issue, that during the period from probably about 03 on, and in particular, we'll say from about 06 or 07, that era, ordinary people out there would be giving mortgages by banks that they couldn't afford. Uh, there were people in, we'll say, jobs that in, in, we've now found a lot of them were unsustainable, uh, built on a property bubble, and the banks were doling out money. Bank of Ireland were given 100% mortgages in 2006. And even if you see the rate of, of, um, of arrears, it's, it's a lot more acute in that, in that cohort. So the problem is, and you made reference to the, to the fact of that if a mortgage, if, if the amount of sustainable mortgage for an individual mortgage holder is less than the value of the, the home, I'd probably look at it from a slightly different perspective. The bank got us into this mess, not the mortgage holder, not the ordinary punter out there. The banks need to find creative ways to make mortgages sustainable. And when I mean that, I mean they should be looking at maybe 40-year mortgages. Uh, they should look at every conceivable possibility. There will be voluntary situations, I accept that. But there is an onus, both moral and financial, on the banks at the moment. And I feel strongly in this issue, because we've had the banks in before us, both in the Finance Committee, uh, over repeated times. And I've seen them coming in since 2000 and as early as 2000 and 
seventh. The banks have a responsibility here, and what I'd ask is, in your dealings with the banks, they have to find solutions, every possible solution, to, to get to a point whereby that a mortgage can be sustainable. Are they going to look at areas, we'll say, extending the level of mortgages, that every possibility will be looked at to keep people in their homes? Um, you're comparing, we'll say, to the situation in the UK. Um, that's the UK. We're, we're, we're a different country here with different issues arising in our banking system. So really what I want is that they, if, if you could look at it from the perspective with the banks, that the onus has to be put back on the banks, the responsibility, to find a formula and a mechanism. You have countries out there where they have mortgages of 40 and 50 years. Why not move to that area? Um, and linking that in with the fact that the banks were recapitalised under the PCAR to provide provisions for such in terms of mortgages. Um, and maybe you might just give an indication is that the central bank figures that are going to publish today, does that show an increase or a decrease in terms of mortgage arrears? So can you just give, we'll say, I think the banks, and I'm calling on the banks, that they, they have to do it in a way that makes mortgages sustainable, rather than just going to the repossession route. Um, I, I, I would agree fully with what you said. I mean, the onus is, as you put it, on the banks to use all efforts to find the right solution for customers. And it's the backdrop that in a lot of those cases, those mortgages were effectively, the banks became, uh, in my view, they became like betting shops. They effectively gave out the, the, the betting, betting token, which was a mortgage, and they became salesmen. And the prudential lending, which the ordinary would say, the, what I would regard a rank and file banker that did it well, in a lot of cases they were pushed aside and the salesmen took over. And the problem here is, is, is it's not good enough for the banks to now come along and say that normal commercial criteria has to resume, when in, in a lot of cases they put the people in the positions where they are now in mortgages that they cannot afford. So, you know, it's, it's not good enough for the banks to walk away from this. And it's something that in the discussions with the banks, can I take it that you will be forcibly making this point to the banks? There's a number of points. The, the first thing I think is it's absolutely a key part of the resolution that the banks engage and find all the solutions they can so that people stay in their houses if they're engaging and if it makes sense for those people to be in that house. And this is where I mentioned earlier about this concept of what is a sustainable mortgage and the key relationship between the value or the maximum amount of a sustainable mortgage and the value of the house. It is not in anybody's interest to see the banks just kicking the can down the road in respect to people. But there are numerous scenarios, if you take them one by one, where in actual fact, for example, interest only may be the right solution for people, particularly if in the future one can imagine a scenario in which those people will find themselves with more disposable income to pay a larger mortgage at that stage and start to pay back the property the value of the, of the market. And, and the obvious example of that is where you have a scenario where there were two people in a household who were typically working and one loses their job. It is very conceivable that the second person will come back into employment in the future and therefore the household income will increase to a point where the repayment of principal may then be possible at that stage. But if we're in a scenario where people cannot even afford to pay the interest amount on the mortgage, given that rates are at particularly low levels at the moment, then the appropriate solution for that, which needs to be looked at again on a one-by-one -one basis, may not very well be to just kick this out into the future. It may be to resolve the situation at the moment so that the excess weight of the, or the, 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 the weight of the excess debt is no longer actually I, under... I suppose, to conclude in this particular point, I suppose, in essence, what I'm making point, this cannot be a license to the banks to engage in wholesale repossessions. And the banks did it in the UK in the, in the, in the early 1990s. Um, and really, the Irish taxpayer and the Irish citizen 
has bailed out the banks to the tune of 64 billion. And what's required here, certainly we want to get people on a sustainable basis. But remember that if you have people that lose their homes and we say have to go into rental accommodation, um, there is still a charge on the state um, in certain circumstances. Um, and, you know, we in Ireland and I think the general public place enormous store in the family home. Uh, it's probably a throwback to our history. Uh, it, 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 it occupies um, an element, and it occupies, I suppose, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It occupies a position in Irish society that c can never be understated. So, really, the banks need to play their part. And, you know, banks will be banks. And it's down to regulation, it's down to direction. And you can have two cases that land on, on a, a banker's desk, both similar, and in certain cases they end up with different results. So what I'm looking at here all the time is that uh, you ha they have to work with the, with the, with the house owner. Uh, a lot of people are under enormous stress at the moment. Um, and it's just something that, I, that I'm very, very conscious of as a public representative. And maybe it's something I've no doubt, Mr. Moran, in your deliberations with the banks that you'll address in a, in a forcible fashion. Yeah, no, we, we are adamant that the banks need to resolve these issues, and they also need to resolve them by looking at all solutions, not just one in particular. To so there is keep no people in the family home. Yeah. yeah, but I think it is also important to recall that particularly in the case of some of the large members of the banking sort of sector, they are the taxpayer. They are owned fully by the taxpayer, and therefore they also need to be conscious, as we talked about public interest directors earlier, they need to be conscious that when they spend money, they spend taxpayer money. And it is appropriate for them to use the capital that was given to those banks to recognise losses in the banking system that are the difference between the total amount of the mortgage and the amount of the mortgage that is sustainable, or if it's larger, in effect, the value of the property, because they have a loss built in. But it is not necessarily appropriate that they should be using taxpayer money to subsidise people living in accommodation, even if it is a family home, that is beyond their means. I suppose. And there are a lot of people who do not fall into that category, for whom, in effect, they are in a scenario where they need assistance, whether it's from the state or whether it's from the bank. But there is a balance to be drawn here that is quite delicate in terms of deciding the scenarios in which an individual or a family should continue to live in that particular house as opposed to a house um, and the extent to which that is a standard of living that they are reasonably and fairly capable of supporting themselves or whether it requires taxpayer assistance to do that, whether in the form of mortgage interest supplement or, any, or rent allowance or whatever else. I suppose the point I'd make is that if you have a mortgage would say that's over a 20-year mortgage. A higher mortgage would be sustainable over a 40 year, over a 40 year period. So I, what I'm saying is, is what's and that operates in the Irish state context. As well I, I was just going to say that. that and that's be... that's exactly the analogy I'm using. Yeah. Okay. So th the laws of, of, of finance apply whether it's to the state, to the bank, to the individual. And obviously, if you can come up with the banks are required, they're extremely creative when they need to be. But in this particular occasion, the fact that the, the taxpayers' money has gone in, they need to be creative in a proactive way to look at measures uh, to if people are looking to, to remain in their family home. And there will be occasions where people will, will, will decide otherwise. But if they're looking to, to remain in their family home, that every option will be explored, including extending the, the, the repayment period of the mortgage. 
uh, and look at maybe ways in terms of intergenerational and that we look at and that has happened in other economies um, and the, you know the old rule book is gone um, there were the old rule book was which was two and a half times salary prime salary one times uh, the second salary, where the banks were giving it out at six times salary and plus. They didn't act in a prudent fashion. So I, what I'm saying is, once I'm putting it on, on, I suppose, in the public record, the banks have uh, both a moral, financial and ethical responsibility to both the Irish taxpayer and obviously the mortgage holder for a family home to make every conceivable effort to ensure that if people wish to remain at a family home, uh, that they work with the mortgage holders, uh, the parents, single people, up and down the country, to ensure that some sort of creative range of measures, and the one I'm talking about, the analogies with the Irish state, we're looking to extend our repayment period to make it more sustainable, and, and that's a very welcome measure. Banks need to be doing likewise with mortgage holders as well. So I'd ask that that would come into the mix. Can I take it that would be the case, Mr. Yeah, and that is the key, that structure you described as the state debt solution is exactly, in many ways, the key to the split market solution okay. where that's appropriate. And I think, you know, like I said earlier, I think it's really important that people, we, we want the banks to engage with customers, but I think it's equally important that customers are engaging Agreed. with their banks because as long as people are, in fact, engaging, that's the way we will find solutions. I have one final question, IBRC, um, and the first question is, is that you probably would have seen reports uh, where the, the special liquidator didn't get to meet the representatives of the staff yesterday. So if you have interaction with, with, the, with the special liquidator, did that meeting would, would obviously, I think, maybe have been in the context of him being appointed to the examiner and the, um, to be receiver of the examiner group, that that meeting would take place with the staff, because obviously it's an issue that, you know, that is of concern. The second issue is the valuation process in respect to the loans in IPRC. Um, how will that apply? Uh, the speculators that are out there will say, in terms of circling the whole planet that we inhabit, where they feed into us, and once again, in terms of the the wind down of IBRC versus NAMA, just if you could just feed us into how what would be the methodology in terms of valuing the loans. Okay, what will happen over the well? I actually has already started. Can we just we would say conclude in the point with the staff with the with the with the? Yeah, no, we will we'll take that up with the liquidator yeah. and, and make sure that the, we've already it. expressed the view through Anne's office that they need to be sure to to deal with the staff. That, that so engagement, we'll, we'll engagement. you'll go back to engagement, we'll take we, we, we will We will take that up, particularly at, at our normal meetings with them. Um, on the IBRC valuation process, the liquidator has already begun to divide the assets of IBRC into different tranches that have similar characteristics and has, I think, also issued requests to, for public procurement pro type uh, reasons to people that are interested in engaging in the job of valuing those assets. And I'm not sure he's done it for all, but I think at the beginning was that he was going to start with those that were of a particular characteristics. This is going out to tender. Going out to tender for people to value the assets, to assist them in the valuation. Once that is done, then, and, and that will happen over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, I think we indicated that we thought that the entire process should finish about, in about a six month period. Um, if we can do it quicker, we'll do it quicker. The, the assets will then be, in effect, sold by the liquidator so as to realize the maximum value that we can have. But to prevent the risk that you might otherwise have in a liquidation scenario as complicated as this, that you would have people perceive this as a fire sale yes. and therefore bid very low for the assets, we put in place a structure whereby, in effect, a floor on the value could be established by the participation of NAMA in the process. Yeah. And only if people are prepared to bid more than the value that NAMA see in the assets by winding them down or running them off over a longer period, will the liquidator, in effect, be selling the assets to third parties.
uh, as part of that process. Of course, once they move to NAMA at that stage, the process will continue. And it may be at that stage that, in fact, the valuation or the realization of the best value for the taxpayer may include a subsequent sale by NAMA of the, of the assets. But so the important point about the participation of NAMA is to prevent a scenario which might otherwise be sort of the perceived notion of a liquidation, which is that you can just descend on it because there's a forced sale and therefore values are at rock bottom prices. So we have put in place a mechanism to do it. And that's critically important because a point that's often missed, although we referred to it earlier, is that the state is in effect guarantor for the value of those assets at the moment, given the fact that this is valued, being guarantor to the central bank of the borrowing that IBRC had in the first place. And can I take it from that that, that will the valuation that you that will say that is now being arrived at and that the work is, will commence in a shortly? Will that valuation be agreed with, with NAMA? That valuation will be done by an independent uh, okay. uh, valuer, and NAMA is required to pay that price if nobody bids more. So, so, so NAMA, NAMA will have some input into the valuation methodology, but once the independent person decides what the value is, that's the bank NAMA pays. And what will be the, the are you at liberty to say, what will be the valuation methodology that will be implied on this? It will be a, a normal commercial valuation. Uh, methodology the, uh, drawn up by the special liquidator. We will be involved in the discussions on it. It hasn't been set in stone yet. And do you anticipate that IBRC has, has made sufficient provisions in terms that the, the values that are currently booked in IBRC's accounts will be reflective of the independent valuations? It's, yeah, at that point? It, it's very difficult to tell with absolute certainty. That, that is the case. Um, our best estimate from the information available to us before we put in uh, uh, into liquidation was that we would break, you know, it would be about even, about what the valuers would value would be about even to and, what and the value of the, and what the, date, the loans what, were. What date, was that value, what date was that valuation in IBRC's accounts but at? That was based on information that the IBRC had given us. It wasn't a valuation of their accounts. They did their own valuation for the end year, so that we, it would be off their end year. Was it uh, off? Pre, pre, pre audited figures that we had. 2000, uh, December 2012. Dece December 2012. Yeah. So it would be based on up to date figures? Up to date figures, but but pre audited. Pre audited. Yeah. And um, would, would there be no work done by the auditors in terms of interim audits, we'll say, in terms of rolling audits? I, I point? honestly am not sure what interim audits they had done. We, we certainly hadn't seen the audit, audited figures at the point where the liquidation happened. And the process then, when would you expect that, that the independent valuation will be arrived? Are we talking six months from today? Are we talking, is that the anticipation? There'll be a rolling process, so some of it should be done in a lot less than that. But uh, um, and Will it go into NAMA in tranches or will it go in as, as one large transfer? Um, probably in tranches, so again, it, it'll, it'll depend. I'm not sure how big the tranches will be. Okay. Certainly the first tranche, the, the valuers for the first tranche, uh, which was the stuff that was most ready for sale and therefore all the information is available, we hoped that the special liquidator will appoint the valuers for the first tranche by the end of this week. And then the final question, uh, in terms of the staff within IBRC, have any uh, indication as to um, in terms of their futures, how many would transfer to NAM, or how do you see that process evolving? Or just yeah. Again, I think we mentioned something similar earlier. It's as much a function of where the assets go as anywhere else. We could envisage a scenario where uh, parts of the assets were they to be sold to a third party may, in actual fact, involve a transfer where they or a purchase where the purchaser is actually interested in the loan officers and the staff working on those on those assets. If they don't transfer, then in effect the assets will go to NAMA, and the more assets go to NAMA, the more they would have requirements for staff. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Chairman, uh, and um, you're, you're all very welcome this afternoon. Uh, uh, thank you for coming along, uh, and uh, I just want to begin by um, uh, reiterating the point you made, Mr. Moore, at the start of your, at the end of your presentation, which is also to thank um, you and all of your staff for the work that goes on in your department. Uh, we, we, we operate for 
perfectly understandable reasons in an unsympathetic environment, given the vast difficulty the country is in and the challenges people face. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I know that all public servants do their best in very difficult circumstances, and that your own Department of Labour, particularly in relation to the promissory note, uh, has delivered things of great value to our state. And I just want to acknowledge that and acknowledge all the officials that were involved in it. Uh, I, I just want to touch on an area um, uh, that um, I don't think has been raised so far, and just put a figure to you that I think you're already aware of, which is the Independent Credit Review Office looking at business credit applications from banks overturned 55%, between 55 and 59% of the original decisions that were made by the banks. What, what do you think of that figure? Um. I suppose there are two reactions. Um, the first is I would prefer there to be no decisions to be overturned. Sure. Um, and, and that's sort of an important first place. But I think it's also very important that we put it in a context. And if you forgive me, I'm just looking for, for a sheet here that I can so we have a, some numbers here. If the if the numbers that we have are, are correct, there were 184,000 loan applications uh, in, in into banks, so that's completed applications. Um, when you actually look at those, 160,000 of them were approved and credit was made available, and 24,000, that's about 13 per cent, were declined. You correctly point out, I, I think you get so the number is in terms of the, the, those that are overturned. But what is disappointing to us when we look at that process is how, why so few people go to a credit review office that has a success rate of about over 50 per cent of overturning decisions. If credit, which it is absolutely key that that's low in the economy, um, and if we have an office which has been set up and we're conducting a review to understand how we can improve it, but if that office has a success rate of in around one and two to actually get decisions across the line for, for credit again, we, we don't understand why it is that 97 per cent of the people that are refused credit do not use that credit review office. And so the danger I have with the numbers that you mentioned is drawing too many conclusions with respect to them because they represent such a small sample of the total process. So part of the, the work that we're doing with the, the SME state our funding body, is to try and understand two parts of the chain in particular. First of all, to try and understand the, the chain that is the person that goes to their bank indicating that they would like credit, and if there are blockages in the system between that point and when it becomes a formal credit application. Because the, once you get to the credit application process, the success rate of those people is actually relatively high. So this is once you move beyond uh, a discussion with the bank manager exactly. and put the formal application When you put your in, formal application you talk about in. stage after that. Precisely. That, yeah. Up to that point, of the, from the point from credit application on, the reality is, is that a very comfortable percentage of the applications are in fact given credit uh, relative to where sort of our economy is. What is not easy to understand is that when you get to the situation of the refusals of credit at that point, the number of people who look either to the credit review office or look to the internal process of the bank is very low. Because if I could just interject there, my understanding of the process is that if you have an application reviews, refused, it first goes to an internal review body, and then if you're unhappy with that, you then go to the credit review office that we're talking about. Am I, am I correct in that? That's right. And one of the things we have said, we have issued a, a recent paper on the credit review office because we conducted a review around exactly these issues because it seems to work well in some scenarios to allow credit to work. And to be honest, in many cases, the process of overturning the bank's decision involves assistance from the credit review office with the particular borrower in terms of the, the, the strength of the business plan or indeed the documentation that's supplied. So it isn't just necessarily a problem with the bank process, it's, it can often be a problem with the application, but that doesn't really sort of 
concern me in the sense of what's important is that we find a solution for that business to get credit. And if the credit review office is able to help in that process, then the question becomes why we don't actually have more people using that resource to do it. And we are, have made the suggestion that perhaps there is something we can do on the point at which the application is declined to, one, increase the awareness of the process of the credit review, perhaps take out the internal appeal out of the process so you can go directly to the credit review office, because we can imagine borrowers who might very easily say, I've tried it once with a bank, there's no point in doing an internal review. So to allow them to go directly to the credit review office, and in particular to make sure that the communication around the application is done in a way we know that they say there is a possibility to appeal, but is it done in a way that actually highlights that well enough, rather than finding that it's far enough down in the letter that it actually doesn't become obvious to the person? And how would you assess at the moment the general um, capacity of the banks to deliver the credit objectives that have been set for them? Well, the banks have been set targets and they are meeting those targets. So you could take it from one perspective that they are doing well. Uh, but I think we would say that they are coming from a situation in the past, I suppose, what, two, year, two years ago when I was first before this committee, where we were looking at this issue, where we found a scenario in which the banks were not equipped to be able to lend to customers, particularly on a cash flow type basis, as opposed to the more traditional lending based on security. And they have, I think, done quite a good job um, there's always work that can be done, but they've done quite a good job of training staff and continue to do so to understand better how to make loans in scenarios where there is no real estate security available. And in particular, that why that's important in an Irish context is that so many of our new companies and growing companies are in sectors which are very, very uh, real estate light. Yeah. Um, and therefore, it's incredib incredibly important that they do that. On the other hand, we have started to divide the population of borrowers into, in effect, at least three broad categories. There are the micro-type companies. There are the companies that are larger than that and are, in fact, successful companies and in good financial strength. And then there are those companies where, in actual fact, the SME if I can use that expression, is still struggling with a legacy debt problem, which has come about either because of a real estate venture that was attached and intermingled with the, with the good company, or in some way tied into personal guarantees and, and, and large debt exposure which hangs over the SME. And so I think each of those categories need different solutions. And on the micro side, what we have tried to do is to introduce a microfinance fund on the, on the credit insurance side and do that and to speed up the process but we have found a very low quality of financial management at the level of microfinance funds or microfinance companies and many of those companies would admit that they don't even do cash flow so the problem is now marrying up cash flow lenders with people that are not necessarily doing cash flow management on the other side on the SME side on the productive SME, I think the banks are moving through that, but I think where they are still struggling, which is not that dissimilar from the situation with, in the personal space of mortgages, is how to separate out the SMEs where there is a legacy debt problem and to, in effect, release the SME that is a good business from the overhang of the other debt. Okay, and, and just to kind of uh, feed that back into the discussion then that we had regarding mortgages. Um, and incidentally, the figures came out when we were speaking. The figures have gone up to 11.9 per cent, which is an increase, but a, apparently it's a, a, a lower rate of, of increase than has been had over, over previous quarters. Um, you were offering the definition early on of um, you know, sustainable mortgage being the person's income versus the current market valuation of the property. Did, did I understand that? I, th I think the most important test of sustainability is to start with the person's income. It's not a problem of negative equity. You start with the income and you work out from that what is the monthly payment that that household can sustain. And yes. in effect, what does that become? And that can move, as, as Deputy mentioned earlier, 
by either extending the term or yep. reducing the principal amount. <coughs> okay. Uh, and then we then relate that back then to the current market valuation of the property. Okay. Is that correct? In, in, in a way, the, the current market valuation of property is in some respects irrelevant. Okay. As long as it's not above the sustainable market. In terms of what the person can afford. Yeah. yeah. Well, th th this is uh, just one point that I just wanted to explore further with you. In terms of what happens between the gap, the gap between what the person can afford and the valuation of the mortgage, the, va the original amount that was taken out, that big gap that's there, and it is a big gap in many cases, is the kind of blanket of personal debt that's weighing economic activity down so much. And what, what happens to that gap, in your view? What should happen to us? Um, there, there are a number of different... I understand the personal insolvency legislation. I'm aware of all that. That's going to come in. But it does appear to me that we have a big group of people for whom the personal, you know, they're not going to come under the parameters of the personal insolvency legislation. Yet they're also in a situation where what they can afford and the market va and the, the, the value of their mortgage when they took it out, as registered on the bank's balance sheet, is really, really big. There's a big gap there. Um, but they can still afford to service their mortgage and keep us on. With the, poly with the options that are on the table at the moment, what happens to that difference? Uh, I'm wary of giving a, a single solution, but yeah. I think it's very helpful to give an illustration okay, as to what might happen. Um, if you had somebody who bought their house for 300000 or with a mortgage of 300000 and due to changing circumstances, they're now only able to afford a mortgage of 200000 yeah. um, and the property has dropped to 150. Okay? That is a scenario in which it seems to us concepts like the split mortgage concept that we've been suggesting should apply has perfect application. And the split mortgage, that then looks at the difference. That looks at the difference. And so that would say that? that the person now begins to make payments on a mortgage as if they had a mortgage of 200000 yeah. which is still above the value of their house. But they will be paying more because they bought the house in the past at a, at a value greater than that, but they will continue to pay, in effect, the maximum amount that they can pay on a sustainable basis, which is a 200,000 mortgage. The difference between the 300,000 and the 200,000 in the split mortgage concept, like we've done in effect with the state debt, gets pushed out into the future to a point where they, either because of the passage of time, or because the other mortgage has finally reached an end, or because they have a change of circumstances, um, unexpected, um, where they come across money, they would then be able to repay that mortgage to the bank. It's important that they actually pay their debts if they're in a position to pay them. But at a point where they're going through their monthly payments, they are not required to, in fact, make payments in respect of that. And there are different of views as to what should happen with respect to interest roll-up on that amount? Yes. And, and Mr. Moran, do we know at the moment how many uh, split mortgages and how many mortgages have been split in that fashion? I think as of the end of last year, it was somewhere just north of 50,000. I think it's probably actually in the numbers today that, that came out. 52 accounts, is that it? Uh, it? I know it's in the numbers. That the centre-back said they were reducing it, but I haven't had long enough to, to look over them. I don't know. But it's, it's certainly a low number. It's and it should be a higher number, we would say. Yeah. But we don't have access yet to enough breakdown of individuals to, in fact, know what there is. And I think there's one other point that is probably worth mentioning, is that as you look at what is a sustainable mortgage, and one of the things that is causing some difficulty, which is easier to understand with the introduction of the personal insolvency legislation, is that it is also critically important that we respect the hierarchy of payments. Mm -hmm. So if somebody has a mortgage which is on their house, it is not an optional debt that allows them to continue paying unsecured debt and not to pay down their mortgage. So another important part in deciding what is, in fact, a sustainable mortgage for a customer to have is that, in effect, the unsecured creditors should also be required to participate in effecting the resolution of the debt, because the priority should be given 
to the secured creditor who is the bank with the mortgage. And that is a blockage that we have seen in the system. And in fact, the central bank have also said, I think recently, that they are planning to now engage with the banks and the credit unions and other unsecured creditors to try and come up with a streamlined way in which that scenario, when you get a particular borrower who has unsecured debt from credit cards or from the credit unions or everywhere else, that there is a better understanding of who should bear what pain. Sure. And I, I, I because I, as I look at the split mortgage model and my understanding of it, which you've confirmed there, I mean, it appears to me to be a model that could have a, play a pretty big role in allowing people to deal with the difficulty they have. Um, and I'm interested in the figure you gave there. But a number of times in the briefing you said, in our session this morning, you said we still don't have access to the banks. Don't, we, we don't have access to the case-by-case -case financial information to allow us to understand, I assume, how far this solution could go. Why don't we have that? Why don't, why don't the central bank or the financial regulator or the Department of Finance have access to that information, given that we're, you know, it, it could be, um, you know, two years, this, it could be two years this month since the last significant recapitalisation of our banking system happened? Yeah, um, I mean, the central bank in the first instance would be closest to that information. But our understanding is that they do, they do not have a full picture because the banks do not have a full picture. And why not? Okay. Well, this is I'm the nub of my question. I'm coming to that. Yeah. Um, we have changed the CEOs of two banks in the last year. And we have seen considerably more progress in respect of engaging with this problem than was the case previously. Okay. And in the first instance, we needed to see improvement on the collection side, because that's actually starting to deal with the new people entering into the system. Mm -hmm. And there is a much more robust process of engagement with respect to customers. We have had a lot of discussion and, and commentary around the blockages in the system. For example, the, the code of conduct that the banks follow in respect of the number of calls that you can make. And we have certainly seen some situations. If I talk about how do I get to 100% of an understanding of this situation, we have seen scenarios in which customers and borrowers are not engaging with their banks. And therefore, we have no ability to get information from them in respect of their personal situation. Has their income gone up? Has it gone down? Do they have other assets that they haven't revealed to the rest of the household or indeed to the bank? And until we have all that information with respect to that group of customers, then it's impossible to know the full situation. Okay? So we have had a, a unfortunate situation in which, although this problem has been getting worse as we go along, that the banks have not invested quickly enough in either personnel or technology to deal with this situation. Now, we have seen very considerable progress in that over the last couple of months, but there is still work to do. And until such time as we have that, will we in fact see or be able to give the answers to the questions you're putting? And I'd love to have all the answers as to what percentage of the arrears belong in split mortgages, what percentage belong in mortgage to rent, and the rest of it. But we have had gross underinvestment in yeah. the banks in terms of technology and the rest. We saw another example of it this morning or last night. And we are living with the consequences of that, trying to repair the situation. And some banks are doing it faster than others. Okay? The regulator has the primary responsibility for chasing them down, and they are on the case in terms of doing that, and we will sort of continue to, to work with them in respect of that. The number of split mortgages that I've talked about is low, I suspect, relative to what we should have in the system. And I've mentioned some of the blockages as to why we can't move faster along the way. Yeah, but it's two years. This is the bit I, I, I can't. I mean, this, this, along with, you know, unemployment, uh, is the biggest personal challenge so many people are facing. The banks were recapitalised two years ago, to for a number of different reasons. One of which was to deal with this, and we, we still, ca they still can't tell us how applicable these solutions will be. And if they can't tell us that, that means not enough people are being helped. The frustration is shared. Yeah. Yeah. Because I split mortgages appears to me to be a solution that should be out there. I'm dealing with people who are in this uh, plight regularly. I'm not meeting people. 
who this has been offered to. Um, and if you're telling me the reason is we don't have the information, I'm glad the frustration is shared because I just come back to the point it's two years ago since the banks were given this funding to deal with this issue. Um, uh, but look, we've made the point. I just want to conclude with two points, if I can, Chairman. Um, if I could just go to Table 2.4 of the Control and Knowledge General's report there, which is on page 17. Um, which I always think, along with the trends in unemployment, is the most depressing, unfortunate table that we have to look at in terms of the, uh, the difficulty that our country is managing at the moment, which is what, what has happened to our national debt um, uh, over the last four years. Um, and then in your um, very helpful review of 2012 documents, your strategy document, you have a very good table in it which also looks at what the trend is for um, debt sustainability across the coming years. Um, uh, which is on page 18 of the report, which completes this when you look at 2013, 2014 and 2015. Um, one question I have for you is, if you look at the different options that the state is pursuing and has pursued at the moment in relation to the solvency of the state, so for example the promissory note uh, arrangement, um, what are the other uh, um, uh, things that are out there that are going to play a role in reducing that value of our national debt, apart from what will happen on the income side of the equation. So, for example, the arrangement that we talked about there earlier on in relation to the rescheduling of programme debt, you know, on <coughs> options one and five, options one to five, is that the kind of arrangement that is going to make diff a difference to the profiling of our national debt across the next few years? The, the most important aspect of, in effect, turning the, the government debt into the, a downward slope, it will be reducing the deficits that we actually have mm, as a state. Right, yeah. um, a second major contributor will be with growing stability in the European scenario and also growing confidence in Ireland. We will find that the cash position which we need to hold at the moment to protect the state against any shocks in the markets or otherwise can then be scaled backwards. And so where we showed the numbers there on, on a gross basis, it's important to remember that the cash number for yeah. the state is almost, so I think it's in excess of 25 billion. It's and then that gives a third. net figure that's lower than And this. therefore it would be significantly yeah. lower and closer to 104 yeah. uh, percent. I think 104, 106 percent is, is actually where we would be if we worked on that basis. But, but as I said, the important point is we move next year into sort of, you know, a capital account surplus to get the deficit down and to get growth levels up. Uh, another important ingredient in respect of where we're going, and we have seen, and I mentioned it earlier in, in my opening speech, how much progress has been made in that, is that the more people have faith in the Irish debt and our ability to repay it and our willingness and commitment to repay it, the lower the interest rates become. And therefore, our, the greater our ability to start working against the, 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 sort of the debt total and to start reducing it, because we are simply paying away less interest, and we're able to use more of the available resources to start reducing the debt. And then I suppose the last element uh, that would, uh, where you would see significant differences or reductions in this is to start to begin well, we've already begun, I guess, to continue with the process of the disposition of investments that the state has, which are not investments that you want to continue with. So shares in banks. Shares in banks, the, the Irish life trade, yeah. and the rest. Okay. Um, okay. Um, just my particular question there is in relation to the potential renegotiation of how we will pay back our programme money. Is that something that will have a material effect on, the, on these figures in the coming years? It won't. I mean, because what you will have is you, it's more there, there is another diagram which I, I should have remembered to, to sort of send it to you, which is the profile of the debt. It will have more of an interest, not so much in the exact amount at the moment, but in the fact that we won't have to replace that debt with market debt in the shorter term. Okay, okay so, that's fine. Uh, 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 I'm going to leave it at that for the time being, actually. Thanks. Uh, uh, Deputy Daisy. Okay. Thanks.
Uh, I'm going to basically start with um, a question about SVR, standard variable rates. Um, and I suppose where I'm coming from with this is um, a lot of people who have SVRs right now are feeling victimized, I suppose, is probably the word I'd use. Um, we have, on one hand, the government, Tisha, yesterday, coming out saying mortgages, arrears, this entire issue is our biggest problem, or one of them. Um, and at the same time, you have the CEOs of AIB and the Bank of Ireland teeing up another increase in the SVR rates. Um, and the question for me from the public is, well, you know, these are banks that are wholly owned or partially owned by the state. Um, and if it's such a huge issue with regard to the government and arrears generally and, you know, repossessions, and you talked about that earlier, um, terminally ill people being dragged from their homes for, you know, uh, evicted. They asked me the question, well, what influence does the government have when it comes to uh, these banks and their, um, their increasing of standard variable rates? Um, some people might say, well, get a fixed rate. And the reality is they can't afford a fixed rate. If they're on 4% right now, where it was 3.5 or 3.25, and it might be 4.25 right now, you get a fixed rate. If you're lucky, you get 5.5%, they can't afford it. So they're stuck in a situation where they're looking at, according to the CEOs of both banks, an increase in that rate. And again, the question I suppose that I, I get asked a lot is, well, what influence does the Department of Finance have when it comes to these banks, if it is such a huge issue, um, repossessions, the lack of the ability to be able to pay back loans and mortgages, um, and, and the interaction that you have in your department with these people, and, and the influence you have with them? Uh, there are a couple of important points, I think, to make. Um, first of all, we, we referred earlier to the relationship frameworks as to what, in fact, our engagement is with the banks. And the importance that the banks operate as commercial entities and ultimately move to profitability. I think the most important influence we can have on the rates that banks can charge our customers is at a level above the banks entirely, which is to do what we can to reduce the cost of the state's borrowing. Because that in itself then feeds through into the ability of the banks to, in fact, borrow money more cheaply. And in the, in the document we produced this morning, which is sort of our annual review on page 37, there's a very clear illustration of what happens and the correlation between the cost of funds for banks and the cost of funds for the state, which means that the more you can bring down the cost of funds of the state, in fact, you bring down the, the expense side of the bank's balance sheet. What is clear also is that we need to have the banks manage themselves on the basis of profitability. And the state should not be interfering in that. We should not be, for example, dictating to the banks that you should charge a maximum sort of interest rate on your, on your mortgages or that you should pay a minimum floor of, a, of an interest rate on deposits. Banks need to be able to manage that, and they also need to be able to compete with each other in respect of that. That's fair enough. Let's go back. We're, we're talking about a, quite a small number of people who are on these variable rates versus the tracker. Okay? And there, there's, a, there's an element of injustice here okay, that they see as we're being targeted constantly, the rate's being pushed up, tracker mortgages protected by the European Central Bank, um, there's nothing can be done by the banks uh, to those rates. I mean, you understand the point I'm making. I understand the, the line is, well, we have to get allow these banks to become more profitable. At the same time, right, the, the interest rates, the variable rates go up and up. And at the same time, uh, the government is saying, well, this is our biggest issue. It comes down to money and ability of, of people to be able to pay. And people are saying, are pointing to the government saying, well, if that's the case, um, if it is the big issue, well, then you're going to have to step in and actually exert some influence and some pressure on the banks to prevent them from increasing a rate that we can't pay as it is. 
I mean, I, and I understand what you're saying about you know, the, 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 the larger picture of how we can help um, as a department uh, as reduce our borrowings generally, and that will filter down to the banks so that, and I've heard bankers complain to me, well, we can't borrow money cheaply, it's costing us too much, um, you know, uh, but it's um, that core and that cohort of people, that small group, whether it's 50, 60,000, 70,000, um, they're feeling quite victimized right now, and they're looking at another increase.